Well, thank you for the invitation. It's a uh, uh, Great to give this talk, even if it's online, and it's great to talk uh, about my group's research. And here I will spend um, several years of work uh, because uh, much of our work is building on the foundations of, of, of even, uh, even earlier previous work. And on that note, I want to start with acknowledging all of my great students and postdocs who over the last more than 15 years uh, have been working with me on Boolean modeling and then developing the methodologies that I will be talking about. And here I especially want to highlight uh, Jorge Zanudo and uh, Jordan Rosum here in this picture who uh, made the biggest contributions in the foundation of this work. So generally speaking, my group's research focus is to model the dynamics of systems of interacting elements. And in the last ooh, more than 15 years, these interacting elements are biological elements. So we are modeling the dynamics of biological systems. And this type of modeling um, is valid in every level of organization in, in biological systems. And we, in fact, do work on ecological networks. I will not mention these networks. Um, instead, I will focus on the molecular to cellular level, where we know that cellular behaviors and phenotypes arise from the interactions of numerous uh, molecular components. And generally speaking, the higher level behavior or phenotype, I will use this word, word phenotype, it's an emergent property and it arises from the totality of the lower level elements and their interactions. So definitely the interactions are very important. And so this is really the, the higher level behavior is a collective uh, behavior of the lower level entities and their interactions. So although we know that in principle, every low, lower level interaction matters, they don't matter equally. So in order to have a better understanding of what is mo more important and less important, we use a network framework. So we construct first a network of the molecular entities and their interactions. And then we also construct a dynamic model of what happens in time. How does information propagate in this network? So the nodes of the network will be molecular species, so molecules in general, and uh, the edges will need to be directed to have a source and a target and also as causal as possible. So correlations uh, are not suitable. And then each node is characterized with a small set of states. So this will be where the dynamics will be applied. It's the states that will change in time. And so this, to describe how these states change in time, and especially due to the interactions in the system, we need a regulatory function for each node. And this function will connect the state of the regulators of the node to its own future state. So this function we traditionally construct by hand, but nowadays there is also software uh, and databases that can be used to at least half automate this process. So then in this model, if there, is, if there are any mutations or errors, uh, then these can be represented as constitutive node states. So keeping a node in the off state or keeping the node in the, in the on state uh, can, be, can represent uh, a mutation in the biological system. And the most important hypothesis is that the long-term states of either all the nodes or of a characteristic subset of the nodes are representative of the cellular phenotype. So in other words, the attractors of the molecular interaction network do represent the cellular phenotypes. And this model, after it's constructed, it can describe how errors and interventions change the phenotype. So it can uh, describe the pathological phenotype of the system. So these are generally the steps that we follow. We first need to construct the relevant network. And this needs to be a focused network. It's not possible to characterize everything um, that a, a, an organism is capable of or a cell is capable of. So we will compile the nodes, the, the uh, agents in the system. We will synthesize the edges and the regulatory functions. And we do this based on the literature, the experimental literature uh, and databases. So this is interaction type of data. And then after the model is constructed this way from interaction data, we analyze the model and determine the attractors. And then we will compare these attractors, the model given attractors to known phenotypes of the system. And this is where state type of data is uh, needed uh, to make this comparison. And when there are uh, discrepancies that are of, of a qualitative nature, then one needs to go back and make changes. So either go back here, change, change uh, parts of the network or change the regulatory functions and do this until the best agreement is found. The best agreement is usually not 100%, but it can get to 
And then when we have validated the model this way, then we can use the model to make new predictions. And usually we do perturbation analysis or intervention analysis and um, study cases that were not studied experimentally and by this give new predictions. And then if this is a collaboration or, or if this is published, then follow-up experiments can be done, uh, which then will either validate the model and confirm the prediction, or if there are discrepancies, then again, you go back um, and improve the model again and again. And here I do want to mention that uh, a current graduate student in my group is, is working on automating this process so that it, it takes uh, less time. Um, so there are multiple ways in which the regulatory functions can be expressed. And our starting point is discrete dynamics. So we use a small number of discrete states to characterize the nodes. So this can, can be as few as two, which would mean active versus inactive, or maybe three having a low, medium, and high level. And the available experimental data inform how many states to use. The more the resolution are in the experimental data, the higher the resolution that we use. And usually there isn't, there is very little known, so there isn't enough resolution, so we go with the simplest. But that doesn't mean that we stop at the simplest. We really um, characterize it in as much detail as much detail exists. Then whether there are just two levels or multiple levels, the regulatory functions can be specified as tables or with Boolean logic. And here, this example is the truth table of the OR function, the Boolean OR function. And as a general guideline, if there are inhibitors, they will uh, be represented by uh, adding in front of them the NOT operator. So their absence is a requirement for a target node to be activated. Independent regulators will be chained with an OR function, meaning that they are independently successful in regulating the node. And uh, conditional regulators will be represented by the AND function. So in our models, time is an implicit variable. Instead of continuous time, we have node updates. And I will not go into the details of that. But I will just mention that there is always an element of stochasticity in the update so that we can probe uh, different kinds of time scales and, and we are not uh, you know, fixed or, or limited to any specific assumption about the time scales. And even though the model itself is discrete, we can do replicate simulations especially that we have this stochasticity in timing and the, a large number of replicate simulations will be able to give continuous outcomes. And I, in case this is something that you have not seen before or not, uh, not seen before applied to biological systems, I do want to mention that this type of logical modeling has had a great success in describing biological systems over the last 20 years. And there is now a consortium of modelers called Kolomoto uh, who are very active in interchanging tools and making them available uh, for people to use. So in my own group, uh, I collaborate with experimentalists and we closed the model experiment cycle that I have shown you in the previous slide in more than 10 cases. So these are the cases where we had both model predictions and experimental testing of those predictions and then revisions to the model. Um, in all of these cases, we have constructed more models and these, we have constructed these models from scratch. So each of them took several years. But now I'm very happy because based on this uh, expertise that we have developed, uh, we are able to make generalizable conclusions. And also in all of these specific cases, we made specific predictions um, and, these, and these tended to be therapies. So suggestions of what kind of intervention would make a pathological phenotype of the system um, be either mitigated or completely reversed. So I will mention three of these models in my talk. So first, let me give you a, a brief illustration of how a discrete model works and how it's able to uh, describe uh, attractors in the system. So my very, very simple prototypical model will have an external signal and also a context. So a context is anything that's not explicitly part of the model. So in a way it's equivalent to a signal. And then um, this is, these three nodes are really the nodes of our system. And uh, these in this case are Boolean, in this simple example, they are Boolean and the Boolean function is written right next to them. And this arrow or circle at the end of the edge means uh, negative regulation. So this is a mutual inhibition between these two nodes. So uh, the function of node A says that node A will turn on if the signal is present or if node B is uh, off, it's inactive. 
So let's consider a situation, an initial condition where the signal is present and the context is context zero. So because the signal is present, node A will turn on. So in the next state, whenever that is, A is active. And then because the function of C is that C will turn on if either A or B is on, C will also turn on next. And this state of the system will not change anymore. So even though we would be looking at a node and applying its regulatory function, the regulatory function would give back the same value, uh, meaning that this is a point attractor of the system, also called steady state. So this way we have, in fact, simulated the trajectory of the system from an initial condition um, to the final attractor. And this, with the same way, we can consider every combination of the signal and the context and find all the attractors of the system or the attractor repertoire of the system. And these five are the attractors of the system. So in each of the conditions, there are there is one attractor, except that for this condition, there are two possible attractors. So the system is bistable in this case. So the model can find all the attractors and all the trajectories that lead to those attractors. And now we define the phenotype um, we have some choices in defining the phenotype, and we certainly should not include the external signal in the definition of the phenotype. So one uh, possibility is to look at nodes A, B, and C and say there are as many phenotypes in the system as many patterns of the activity of node A, B, and C. And as you can see, there are two of them. So this system has two phenotypes. And in one condition, both phenotypes are possible. And the model can also describe what happens if there are errors in the system or mutations that would correspond to a pathological case. So for example, if A is off and it stays off, then we can recalculate the attractors and find that instead of five, now there are four. But again, looking at the patterns of node A, B, and C, there are still two phenotypes. They are just modified from the original ones. So that's the idea. Of course, a real system is much more complicated. And in, for a real system that has more variables and so its state space is much larger, there are multiple ways of determining the attractor repertoire and I will focus on one that is developed my, by my group. And the key idea here is to integrate the interaction network with the regulatory functions and gain a so-called expanded network. It's a, it's a logic network. Um, or logic expanded network is another way that we refer to it. So uh, another network that reflects both the interactions and also the specific logic of the interactions. And to give you the take home message directly, uh, we found that certain subgraphs of this expanded network identify decisions of the system uh, where something irreversible happens and the system gets trapped into a small set of its sub, uh, sub a so, small subspace of its state space. And Understanding these decisions also allows us to control the system. Controlling these subgraphs drives the system into a desired attractor. And having this understanding is able uh, to lead to applications um, and, and therapies. So now I will go into some details of this. So how does this expanded network work? So for each state that a node can have, which can be two if, if it's Boolean, but more than two if it's multi-state, multi-level, uh, there will be a virtual node. So for example, if node A can have three states, one, zero, one, and two, there will be three virtual nodes. And then in the regulatory function, the all relationships don't need any um, specific accommodation, but the end gates um, should in fact be represented by hyper edges. So edges that start from multiple starting points. Um, instead of having a hyper edge, which is difficult to represent, we flatten them out by using so-called composite nodes, these black dots. So there will be multiple edges coming into the black dot and then a single edge leaving the black dot and, and going into the target node. The very important definition of these hyper edges is that it represents logic sufficiency. So altogether, those regulators are sufficient to drive uh, the activity of the target node. Or if there's a single edge, uh, representing uh, either a single regulator or a regulator that's connected with an OR gate to another regulator, that alone is sufficient. So let's look at our example and let's focus on the context one. So in this case, this is the interaction network and now the function simplified a little bit by assuming a specific context. And this is the corresponding expanded network. So as you can see, now the virtual nodes have node states in them. So this virtual node corresponds to the state one of the signal and there is a virtual node for the state zero of the signal. 
and this virtual node represents a state one or on state of node A. And there is an edge from this, the, the value one of the signal to the value one of A, meaning that the value one of the signal is sufficient for the value one of node A. This edge here says that the inactivity, the value zero of node B is also sufficient for the activity of node A and so on. And this is an example of a hyper edge or a composite node. So this says that the simultaneous um, off state of the signal and on state of node B is necessary in order for node A to take its off state. So this way, this edge is a sufficient relationship and this combination of three edges that have the same composite node is another sufficient relationship. So this was the network and the subgraphs that uh, I was talking about are uh, self-sufficient cyclic relationships. So here you can immediately notice that there is a cycle uh, between two virtual nodes. And so these self-sufficient cyclic relationships come from cycles, positive feedback loops in the original network. And in fact, there was a mutual inhibition, which is a, an overall positive feedback loop. And one reflection of that in the expanded network is this cycle of sufficient relationships. And that's exactly what a stable motif is. It's the simplest example of a stable motif. Um, so another example of a stable motif would, com would uh, contain composite nodes, but in such a way that it's a sufficient relationship that comes back to the source. And so the key property of these stable motifs is that they can maintain an associated steady state regardless of the rest of the network. They are self-sustaining. So if such a stable motif uh, arrived into that associated steady state, it will stay there no matter what happens to the rest of the network. So although it's connected to the rest of the network, it no longer responds to any changes in the rest of the network because it is self-sufficient. And the fact that this subset of the nodes um, is fixed and stays fixed from then on forever, this traps the system into a subspace. So, so a certain degree of freedom disappears from the system and potentially maybe all the freedom disappeared from the system. And that's the case in this very simple example, because if this stable motif locks in, that means that A is in the uh, one state and B is in the zero state, which will also imply that C is one. And that completely determines um, the attractor of the system. And in fact, we have seen previously that no matter uh, what the value of the signal is when context one is, this is the attractor of the system. So the locking in of this stable motif completely determined the behavior of the system. In other cases, a single stable motif is not sufficient. And this is a real example. It's an interaction network of uh, proteins called cyclins and their helpers, the cyclin dependent kinases um, that um, determine the phase of the cell cycle. So this is the network, it's an 11 node network, and you can see there are multiple mutual inhibitory loops and also positive feedback loops. And these are the stable motifs. And the stable motif is both a network motif and the associated state, and the state is encoded in the color. So gray means off and blue means on. And so the, the original system has three stable motifs and either one of them can lock in. Uh, and that's a decision in the system. Whichever locks in first, then that's, that's an irreversible commitment. And if the motif P2 locks in, that completely determines the attractor of the system. But in the other two cases, that's not a complete commitment yet. There are still multiple ways to go. And you see P0 can be followed up by one of four uh, stable motifs and P1 can be followed up uh, by one of two. So there is a, is a gradual, um, or incremental trapping of the system um, ultimately into an attractor. And the three attractors of the system represent different uh, ways of cell cycle arrest. So the cycle, cell cycle not progressing. And this is an illustration. So it's an equivalent illustration of, the, of uh, this uh, so-called succession diagram of the stable motifs. Oops, sorry. So these states are states where no stable motif locked in yet. Um, 
And these are Garden of Eden uh, spaces. So not just Garden of Eden, Eden states, but spaces. So there are more states. And the property of these is that if the system gets out of such a state, it will never, never come back. And then these gray circles and ovals represent the stable motifs. And as the system goes through the different decisions, so this is the, here, these are the, this is the succession diagram repeated exactly. The ovals get smaller and smaller and ultimately the attractors will be at the intersections of the ovals. And this representation and also the succession diagram is an equivalent reduced but, but lossless compression of the so-called state transition graph that would contain every state of the system and every transition between them. So this is the state transition graph. It's, it's very non-approachable visually. The only way, only reason why we see something is that it's colored the same way as the succession diagram. Uh, so only after understanding the succession diagram can we understand the state transition graph. And it, in fact, there is no gain of information uh, by constructing the state transition graph. And especially that the state transition graph is not possible to construct because its size grows exponentially with the number of nodes. So only for small systems is it possible to, uh, to construct. The succession diagram is a much better representation of everything that the system is capable of and, and, and looking at the um, successive commitment of the system and ultimately finding uh, the attractor. So I will not have time to go into details, but I do want to stress that we have uh, <clears throat> extended the concept of stable motif uh, to continuous systems as well. So the concept is preserved and it, it is applicable um, in differential equation models as well. Um, so it's for specifically for this very general form of differential equations where there's a synthesis term and a, and a degradation term. And both of these functions are monotonic in their argument. So each node of the expanded network of the continuous system is a threshold statement about the continuous variable. The expanded network is not unique as in the uh, discrete system, but nevertheless, it is possible to construct. And the edges mean the same thing as, as in, the, uh, in the Boolean system, maintenance of truth of a statement. So for example, in our system, oh, sorry, um, in our simple example, uh, the virtual nodes now may be statements like A, the value of A is larger than 0 0.7, and there is a positive feedback, a mutual uh, sustenance between a high value of A and the low value of B. So the concept and, and, and also the representation of the stable motif is the same. So generally, if a system satisfies the statements that form a stable motif, then it will keep satisfying them regardless of the rest of the network. And this traps the system into a subspace. So let me give you a real example. It's uh, based on a Hill function uh, model of uh, T-cell signaling. Um, this is the network and uh, the, the parameters of the Hill functions are, uh, are on the edges. The network is strongly connected, but not all the uh, nodes participate in the stable motif. This node TCRP actually is not part of the stable motif. Um, and when you look at the statements um, of the virtual nodes, one variable is very constrained. So it is constrained to have a high value or a value very close to one, but the rest are not constrained uh, uh, much at all. And here we can verify that indeed, no matter what we do to this node, which is not part of the stable motif, the stable motif will not be destroyed. Uh, the variables in the stable motif will still keep uh, satisfying their thresholds. So in these representations, the dashed lines correspond to the thresholds. And so we look either at the unconstrained uh, dynamics of, or the dynamics of the unconstrained system. This is the first case. Or we saturate. So we give uh, the maximum value to this node or we knock it out completely or we make it oscillate with a huge amplitude. As you can see, the continuous lines are still within the bounds that correspond to the thresholds. So the stable motif uh, is still preserved. So now back to Boolean systems, here's another real example. This is a model of T-cell signaling uh, in the context of disease TLGL leukemia. And in this model, uh, we have found out that by, by a Boolean model of this uh, system, we have found out that there are two attractors, two phenotypes, and one corresponds to the normal behavior in the system, which is uh, programmed cell death apoptosis. 
And the other is the survival of these T cells that are in fact not supposed to survive. And that is actually the uh, cause, uh, cause of the disease. So leukemia is the representation of that. And this is the stable motif succession diagram. And what you can notice is that at multiple points in this uh, diagram, there are multiple branches and the system takes one of the branches. This represents a decision in the system. And several of these table motifs are mutually exclusive. And the clearest example here is the T motif versus the red motif. The same three nodes are in the off state in the T motif and in the on state in the red motif. And the on state is also combined with the off state of a fourth node. And if the red motif stabilizes, that leads to the leukemia attractor. If the teal motif stabilizes, then there are some other stable motifs that need to lock in, but there are no decisions. And there's a third motif, which if it uh, locks in, the system is, so, so the system's degree of freedom reduced by just a tiny amount, but there are lots of uh, possibilities for the decision. But then after that decision is made and either the teal or the red motif locks in, then the outcome is again given. So this way, uh, this interplay of the mutually exclusive stable motifs determines the attractor repertoire of the system. And our understanding of this repertoire by constructing the stable motif succession diagram allows us to control the system because now we can drive into an attractor by eliminating the diverging possibilities, by, by, by locking in uh, a stable motif via locking in one of its nodes or, or a group of its nodes. So we find the minimum number of nodes that need to be uh, locked in, fixed in a state to drive the stable motif, which will then as a domino effect drives the rest of the stable motifs. So we have developed very efficient algorithms to do this and both find the attractor repertoire of the system and control the system uh, to drive it into an attractor. Um, and these are um, incorporated into, into the Python library, Py stable motifs. And this is the work of Jordan Wilson. Um, so let me give you another uh, real example. Uh, this is a, a model of, of, the, of a cell fate change called epithelial to mesenchymal transition. So epithelial cells are like skin cells are, are an example of epithelial cells. They don't move, they are bound to each other. While mesenchymal cells are separate and they can move. And there is this process called epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which is a normal process in wound healing, for example, uh, but it's also the first step of cancer metastasis. So in this case, it is not good. And we, it's something that we want to prevent from happening. So my former MD PhD student, uh, Steven Steinway constructed the network and also the model corresponding to epithelial to mesenchymal transition or EMT in response to um, any of 12 different signals. These signals are shown in blue in this case. And he focused on a single uh, marker of this transition, and that is the transcriptional downregulation of the binding protein E. coherin. So E. coherin is the outcome. It's, it's low activity or low expression um, is the step that's shown here as a marker of the transition. And the network shows <laughs> everything in between. So this network has eight stable motifs. And these are, I'm showing four of them. Um, and the color again represents the corresponding states. And it turns out that any one of these stable motifs is able to lead to the downregulation of ecotene, so to lead to the corresponding phenotype. And any of the signals can drive all of the stable motifs. So in fact, there is, is a very remarkable robustness in achieving this attractor. So any of the signals can is sufficient, logically sufficient to activate all of the stable motifs, any and all of the stable motifs. Any of the stable motifs is able to activate any and all of the stable motifs and any of the stable motifs is uh, able to lead to the outcome. So unfortunately, uh, in, in terms of uh, therapies, this is difficult to reverse, but nevertheless, we asked what, uh, what does it take to prevent um, EMT in response to one of the specific signals, TGF beta? And also what does it take to reverse, to, to lead to the reverse process, make the mesenchymal cell into an epithelial cell? And I will just quickly give you the answers. So it takes a two node intervention, a specific two node intervention to prevent TGF beta driven EMT. Um, and one example of that is to disrupt uh, the protein SMAD and, and the protein RAS. And there is, 
five other possibilities and Steve Steinway did verify experimentally that these, uh, in fact, this did work. Um, and a single intervention is never successful. And that actually drives the system on into, into an even more pathological phenotype. And in order to revert the transition, we will need to lock in the stable motif that corresponds to the epithelial state. And this is the stable motif. It includes 66% of the original network. So a very large fraction of the original network, uh, but it takes only a perturbation of five or intervention into five nodes one in each of these yellow domains to lock in the stable motif and achieve the epithelial uh, phenotype. So my last example, real example, is our recent model of another phenotypic change, um, yeast to high fold transition in um, C. albicans. So yeast are like small spherical cells and the high fold are branched structures. Um, and this yeast to high fold transition is the first step of, uh, of um, C. albicans becoming more pathogenic and, and being uh, able to better spread in the host. So we modeled um, the network that responds to three different signals in the environment. And the, the markers of, or the phenotypes of this uh, transition. And so there are two specific phases, the high fall initiation phase and the high fall maintenance phase, which we represented as separate nodes. And different sets of genes are transcribed and work together to lead to these different stages. So this is the succession diagram that corresponds to the case where the environment is favorable for the transition. And as you can see, there are multiple stable motifs. And a succession of two stable motifs in any order does lead to the high fall phenotype. But we identified that there are also two other intermediary phenotypes, which we called yeast-like, because it's very similar to the yeast phenotype and high fall like So in order to prevent the, this transition from happening, we would want the system to go into either one of these uh, phenotypes. And that is possible by stable motif-based uh, 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 attractor control. So, we want the system to make the decision that doesn't lead to the high fall phenotype. So we uh, found all the possibilities for this and then also experimentally verified one of them, which was that um, by inactivating um, HDAX <laughs> drives the green stable motif, this stable motif here, and that leads to a yeast-like phenotype and, and not to the uh, high fall transition. So with that, I will conclude. So the, I kind of described this, this program that we, we have been working on for, uh, for many years now as to connect uh, connectivity patterns of the interaction network to decisions and then to attractors uh, in the dynamical system. And so we found that these positive feedback loops and the, the associated stable motifs are such connections that represent decisions in the system. Um, our methodologies that we use apply to discrete or continuous dynamics. And the same network allows multiple mutually exclusive phenotypes. So, and so by this accounting of the stable motifs, we are able to understand everything that the system is capable of. So what is the attractor repertoire? And then we can also drive the system by taking away its freedom to, to make decisions and just, just have a single, single path uh, to it to drive it into a detractor. And we have an efficient implementation of this in this pi stable motif uh, library. So if a network has a stable motif, uh, then, and we want uh, to drive the system out of the attractor that corresponds to the stable motif, we must control the stable motif. We cannot exert control in any other part of the system because the stable motif is self-sufficient. So we will need to have a direct influence on nodes of the stable motif. And this is important for therapies um, and for targeted therapies, for example. So it is something that is very important to recognize. And so finally, I want to thank all of, uh, um, all of my students and postdocs who worked on this. So the foundations of the of this logical description and the extended network were done by Rei Shang Wang uh, many years ago. Um, and the concept of stable motif is due to Jorge Zanudo. And then Jordan Rosum is the one who made the current implementation, which is very, very fast and efficient. Um, and everybody else here made uh, key contributions, which I tried to summarize here. So thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to take questions.
Okay, so there is plenty of time for questions. So, anything? I have one question about, uh, say, the continuous system. So, I, mean, I mm -hmm. have much personally have much more experience with continuous dynamical mm -hmm. systems. I mean, uh, you were mentioning at some point some conditions that must be satisfied, mm -hmm. so uh, in order to re uh, replicate the approach. I mean, mm -hmm. how uh, say severe or how standard are these questions in the problems that uh, are say biologically important? Yeah, so these are very, very mild conditions just to have monotonic functions and one of, only one of them needs to be bounded. All of the models, <laughs> modeling frameworks uh, that are applied to biological systems will uh, have these conditions satisfied. Most of the models use heal functions and heal functions do satisfy these conditions, uh, but it doesn't, uh, so these are really very mild. Okay. So good if to... you want, I can I can go back to um, the yeah, but I, I probably not. <laughs> so it's, there's just two terms. <laughs> there is a positive term and a negative term, and the only requirement is that both of them are monotonic functions. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? So looks like everything was very clear. So. Uh... Okay, there is a question. Ah, okay, okay, no, sorry, it's only an, an announcement afterwards. So if there, is, there are no other questions, I think we can uh, warmly thank the speaker for this very nice talk.